was perhaps the biggest concentration of firepower ever seen since World War II. It was the Gulf War, 1990 to 91. It ended with a land battle lasting just 100 hours, a brief and devastating act of military destruction. And in the vanguard of that onslaught was A Squadron, first the Queen's Dragoon Guards, medium reconnaissance for the main force, operating up to 50 kilometers ahead and calling down artillery and airstrikes on enemy armor, ordnance and strongholds. It was a job they carried out superbly well. They trained for years to operate as the eyes and ears of armored formations in the event of war in Europe. Now, they were called on to display those skills in the totally different environment of the Arabian desert. This is the story of QDG's involvement in that war. A Squadron went to the desert, but they were not alone in carrying the QDG flag and reputation. By the time the land offensive began, two-thirds of the regiment was deployed to support the United Nations action. And they did it in the best traditions of the men they call the Welsh Cavalry, the Queen's Dragoon Guards. August 2nd, 1990. Saddam Hussein unleashed Iraq's hugely powerful armed forces across the border with neighboring Kuwait. Within hours, they had occupied it and taken over its oil fields. The invasion of one Arab state by another provoked worldwide condemnation. In a display of unanimity unseen since the Korean War, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution which condemned the invasion and demanded the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of Iraqi forces from Kuwait. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 660 of 1990. Nations from across the world, led by the United States and Britain, now formed an alliance against Iraq's aggression. Wolfenbüttel, Germany. First, the Queen's Dragoon Guards received orders to deploy an independent squadron to the Gulf as the medium reconnaissance for the 7th Armoured Brigade, the Desert Rats. This was based on A Squadron, whose training was stepped up in pursuit of battle fitness. The regiment pulled together. An intensive maintenance check was carried out on all squadron equipment. Selected vehicles were then driven to the spray shop to be given a new coating of war paint. Although still 3,000 miles from the theater of operations, the QDG were beginning to look like the desert rats of old. In the background, Saddam Hussein was hurling defiance at the rest of the world, but the alliance against Iraq was slowly gathering in strength. The threat of a shooting war was real, Training with live ammunition now assumed a deadly purpose. QDG were learning new lessons quickly and had to provide extensive backup support for the whole Gulf operation. By the time the Gulf War began, QDG were represented across the board, from the Joint Headquarters in High Wycombe to Divisional and 7th Armoured Brigade Headquarters, as reinforcements to several other regiments as chemical recce troops and battle casualty replacements. Morale was high. The regiment had helped train, equip, and support the squadron going to the Gulf. The problem was that everyone wanted to go with them. I've got about 300 soldiers here who all want to go. Um, I'm going to have to disappoint most of them. September 27, 1990. As training continued, a Squadron's vehicles left for Bremerhaven, where they sailed for the Gulf in a rusting ferry named the Macandian Queen. The rest of the squadron began leaving in October. Everyone knew they'd be separated from wives, families and friends for at least six months, but there was always the thought that this might be forever. Well, it's very upsetting, obviously, but there's nothing I can do about it. He has to go. 
I have to stay here, so just do the best I can while he's away. Well, very upset, but when you marry somebody in the army, it's a commitment you make. You've got to accept that they're going to go away, but I think I'm ready. He's going to go, and i just got to think of him coming home. It was a shock, I think, to begin with. I was very upset for about two days, but now everything's calming down. They're getting ready to go, and the wives begin to accept him. October 16th, the day of departure for A Squadron. Time for a few last words, a few tears, a few smiles, and a great many unspoken thoughts. The troopers, though, were in high spirits. He's definitely going to miss the beer the most. <laughs> definitely. Boys. <laughs> As a women, one of the boys got some makeup on him. <laughs> <laughs> The QTG were heading for Saudi Arabia and the port and industrial complex of Al Jubail. Positioned on the Gulf, this was the gateway for a huge and continual flow of men and materiel. It was coming from all across the world in preparation for war. Naturally, even amid this breathtaking feat of logistics, there was confusion. A squadron arrived in its midst, as the squadron leader explained in the first of his messages to those at home. Really, my message uh, to you all back in GFPA 101, is A squadron is well and uh, in good heart. So perhaps you know what's been going on in the last uh, eight days, nine days. A, a brief resume. We arrived and uh, we were down in the docks. Uh, if I say it was uncomfortable, it's an understatement. We lived in a great big hangar housing probably a thousand people. The sanitation, well, there wasn't much, and the food, there wasn't too much of that either. And uh, after about day three, we broke out and uh, went off to the desert for a couple of days. A first taste of the Arabian desert, in NATO gear and a temperature of 130 degrees in the heat of the day. It was a harsh introduction. A squadron was to work closely with the US Marines. They had arrived in Saudi Arabia some time before and were quartered in air-conditioned barracks. To the squadron's eternal gratitude, they were invited to join them. Acclimatization was the first priority. That and getting haircuts. And preparing for a war with chemical weapons. Okay, Tiff, say your piece. The idea, see, is to see how fast you can drink a pint of water through a respirator. Another thing that's happened in the last couple of days is now we've been given our brand new desert combats, which are very nice, although they do seem slightly thicker than the ones that we were given originally, and some people are complaining that they're quite warm. October 26th. The Macandian Queen finally limped into El Jubail a week late, after a voyage made tedious by frequent breakdowns. However, QDG vehicles survived the trip very well. Only one had to be towed ashore. Maintenance and repairs were carried out round the clock a tribute to professionalism of the LAD. Thereafter, the squadron's machinery was moved 35 kilometers up country on transporters. During the journey, it became vividly clear once more that A Squadron's armored recce vehicles formed only a small part of an endless stream of equipment now being deployed in the desert. And that was only the first leg of a long trek which was to take many of the QDG into Iraq and onto Kuwait before the end of their five-month desert odyssey. After unloading, the crews faced a 30-kilometer move across open desert to practice driving and navigation skills. QDG's first role in the desert was medium reconnaissance for the British 7th Armored Brigade, which, in turn, came under the tactical command of the American 1st Marine Division.
the desert itself was hot, remorseless, and totally without features. It made navigation a nightmare until science came to the rescue. Uh, for you all back home, this is the new gadget. I'll let Captain Chef and Baron zoom, on it, uh, 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 zoom uh, in on it. This is the Magellan uh, satellite navigation system. Totally handheld, but you can put it in a vehicle. It's the Troop Leader 3. It tells you where you are and will also navigate you from A to B. But no problem, however desperately serious, can survive the lash of a British soldier's irreverent humour. They parodied their officers mercilessly when sending their videotaped messages home. Mr. Fenton said we had a shortage of water. Ha, did we ever? As you can see, nice desert scenery around, and we're having a great time. See you all soon. 21st birthday, and what a boring day it was. Look at these two presents from Captain Marks. That is all he could get me. Pathetic. All my love, Andy. Miss you, love you lots. Bye. Well, here we go, desert maintenance on the wagons. As you can see, it's pretty but hard. You gotta dig the shit out of the gearbox twice a day. The scale of the military build-up right across the Gulf Theatre was about to reach epic proportions. Clearly, there was to be no underestimation of the enemy's strength, merely a patient determination to wait for the most opportune moment and then to hit him hard with a fearsome concentration of weapons. At the peak of the Gulf War, there were half a million men, 126 warships, 1,053 aircraft from 26 nations. With their vehicles and crews becoming acclimatized, A Squadron joined the 7th Armoured Brigade and moved into the desert. Here, an intensive training program was devised to test men and machinery in desert conditions, often in full NBC equipment. It was a period of fundamental adjustment. Reconnaissance exercises were pursued over new terrain, now in conjunction with US Marines as well as British units. 3,000 miles from the familiar plains and forests of Northwest Europe, there were new lessons to be learnt, new skills to be acquired, and new techniques to be honed. They embraced air and artillery cooperation, gunnery and live missile firing, more navigation, and eventual adjustment to the sheer size of the desert. Global positioning systems proved their worth time and time again and were invaluable in a series of demanding Boeslager type battle runs devised to test the skill and resource of everyone within the squadron. November 18th, A Squadron completed its initial training by moving 120 kilometers north to a new location at Manifa Bay on the Gulf Coast. Manifa Bay became the squadron's leaguer by the sea and was to act as its base training camp and home for the next six weeks. Making the best use of the desert, leaguers were low profile affairs dug into the sand and draped with camouflage netting. You've got the sunroof, cooking, kitchen, is the backyard where we keep the rubbish. Watch out, watch out. This is the living room. This is old Trevor Thompson digging a trench for SHQ. Ooh, uh. yeah. Cooks worked wonders, as cooks always do. Personal hygiene was more important than ever. Showers were rigged wherever possible, and foot and crotch inspections were routine. It was not simply a matter of individual comfort, but of squadron efficiency. Regular washing and cleaning teeth were essential to staying fit in a harsh environment. Other essentials involved a shovel and a short march. Police, 
In the outside world, the talk was of war in the Gulf. Military men forecast slaughter on a vast scale. There was much debate, but the alliance was holding. In Britain, Mrs. Thatcher was deposed in a lightning strike worthy of the SAS. A Squadron had, by this time, acquired its own forward air controller and an artillery forward observation officer. It meant QDG would now have the capacity to order up its own air and artillery strikes whenever it identified suitable targets. The cooperation achieved between QDG and its air and artillery backup was outstanding. Training together enabled them to develop an indirect fire cell which became a model within the artillery group. At the same time, even closer cooperation with the US Marines involved the increased use of helicopters. One departure from normal recce practice was a scheme to airlift the QDG into battle. The thinking was that A Squadron's vehicles could be dropped behind the Iraqis' main defensive positions in southern Kuwait and attack their reserves with air and artillery. The plan was never tested, but the marine choppers were in constant use during exercise hide and seek. This was a tactical exercise in which the squadron advanced at night to locate dug-in marine positions using radar and thermal imaging. Also, we have Americans actually in with our vehicles. We've done a swap over. We did a similar exercise two days ago. We'll repeat it today. Some of the force reconnaissance from the Marines have come into our scimitars, and we put some of our men into the ground to take their place, purely to see what it's like for each man to see the other side. Training was also a test of QDG's logistics, and the Echelon worked wonders in keeping the squadron supplied with such diverse items as body armor, laser target markers, clothing, spares, and, of course, food. It wasn't all sweat and sand, of course. R&R &R was arranged on an 18-day rotation which gave everyone a four-day break from the heat, the flies, and dust. And despite the shadow of impending war, there was still time for rugger on the sands. Not the arms park, but every bit as passionate Queen's Dragoon Guards also became the focus of media attention. Among the visiting correspondents was the BBC's Kate Eddy. This is the story she sent home. Conspiratorial plotting. This is the squadron with the lonely job of sneaking up under the noses of the Iraqis. A squadron of the Queen's Dragoon Guards. One lot disappear into the dust to go hide with the Americans. And then it's a very serious game of cat and mouse. With the skills of a poacher, this squadron has to creep up on an enemy, hunt him, observe him, dodge him. And specialist viewing equipment makes the desert night reveal what the human eye cannot see. An American plane towing a decoy. An armored vehicle trying to steal away invisibly. Hour uh, after hour of practice, hide and seek with the Americans, but coming to terms with night fighting and chemical warfare. Seeing without being seen, you know, or, or hearing without being heard, like, it's, um, we've got to spot them before they spot us. Or should there be use of force against Iraq, these young men will be way ahead of the huge main battle group, out in front, getting information which should strengthen the fighting chance of others, but probably at a price. It's a balance, really. We understand that. It's a necessary role. It has to be done. Uh, I believe that I've actually got the equipment, I've got the training, I've got the men to be able to carry out that task with, hopefully, a minimum risk. But I'm afraid war is a risky business. And back home, QDG families watched television, wondering if there was going to be war and how their men would react. He'll be fine, I think. I don't think he'll, you know, do anything stupid. He'll just do as he's told and he'll do it well. I'm sure he's a wee bit apprehensive of the situation. The letters we get back from him are a little bit apprehensive, but at the end of the day, that's what we get trained for. Britain had now increased its Gulf commitment to an armoured division. For the regiment, this meant more men and equipment were being prepared for deployment. In the meantime, 
They could only listen to the news and wait. Yes, indeed, it's a very worrying time for us, of course. Uh, frustrating, because a lot of us, most of us left behind here, would like to be there with them. Um, if I can say sharing the experience, that may sound strange to your viewers, but I'm sure they'll know what I mean when I say that. Um, but, of course, also worrying, because we are at the end of a line of, of communications. We don't know what's happening day by day, minute by minute. Uh, we would love to know that. As 1990 moved towards its close, the odds on a land war in the Gulf shortened. Saddam spoke of delivering a mighty defeat on America and its allies in the mother of all wars. Christmas in a Muslim country, in the desert, and on the brink of war. Somehow, Father Christmas managed to fight his way through to the QDG, along with paper hats and streamers, turkey and goodwill. Showing to you all what a there was also a concert party in which every aspect of army life and every shred of military discipline was dissolved in dreadful lampoons and comic songs. Hello, Mac. Hello, Boog. Now you got us in the poo. There's no choppers. Party too. Oh, fuck, there's a G-72. <laughs> Christmas Day began with a boat race across Manifa Bay between the troops of the squadron. Support troop upstaged the rest by turning up with an actual boat. This was quite properly handicapped by the squadron leader shooting a hole in the hull with his revolver. After the race, he and his fellow officers did what tradition demands and comradeship calls for. They waited on the soldiers at lunch. After which there were presents from home. Perhaps it was that someone presented a bill, or perhaps it was the effect of too much tea and lemonade. It didn't matter. A Squadron was still full of Welsh voice to sing Silent Night and to be linked for a few moments by satellite to those at home. Holy night. Very good Christmas. Be better if we had been with you, but that's uh, part of life's rich pageant out here. But uh, very traditional carol service, an excellent review, and then lunch, raft races, RAF fly past at about 15 to 20 feet, and uh, the officers eventually dined thanks to Mr. Fortnum and Mason, and Matthew Glove, and Mr. Gosset. We're probably the best trained medium reconnaissance squadron that the British Army has seen for many years, and so we should be. We are jolly well equipped and climatized, fit and ready to do whatever we have to do. The United Nations resumed its call for Saddam Hussein to pull out of Kuwait, setting a deadline of January the 15th. At home, Britain's new Prime Minister, John Major, underlined the nation's commitment to the United Nations' fight against aggression. Of any of the allies. They are all perfectly clear. If he gets out of uh, Kuwait, he won't be attacked. If he doesn't, then he will be. And that is the position of all the allies. And there will be no distinction between us on that one. But what it is absolutely imperative that Saddam Hussein understands that we are serious. January 6th, another change of command. With the arrival of the 1st Armoured Division, A Squadron came under the command of the 16th 5th Lancers, themselves reinforced by 40 men of the QDG, although still under the umbrella of the US Marine Corps. A Squadron busied itself with training the 16th 5th, fitting the new BID-300 secure radio speech system, running trials on its viability and waiting. January 15th came and went. The QTG sent cheerful messages home. Well, you look after yourself, and I love you, Miss Sue, and I'll see you soon. Bye now. Hey, Kathy. 
Hey, Jenny. Um, I guess by the time you'll see this, it'll all be over with and we'll all be on our way home. Give my love to the kids. Hope to see you soon. Love you. Don't worry, we'll all be back. We're all safe and sound at the moment. We're all doing well. January 17th. The air war began suddenly and the Gulf conflict took on a new reality. January 23rd, QDD was on the move again, a 300-kilometre drive westward to concentration area Keys by the Wadi al-Batin, where 1st Armoured Division came under the command of the American 7th Corps. As the division occupied Keys, 16th 5th Lancers provided a recce screen to the north with A Squadron to the northwest, forward of 4th Armoured Brigade. The squadron practiced artillery raids and took part in a rehearsal for the breach crossing of the Iraqi defences to the north and east. The plan involved a concentration of armour rarely seen before, a tribute to the complete mastery of the skies won by Allied air forces. Saddam Hussein received a final warning. The coalition will give Saddam Hussein until noon Saturday to do what he must do begin his immediate and unconditional withdrawal from Kuwait. February 14th, more change. The squadron came under the command of the artillery group and was ordered to move some 130 kilometers northwest. This involved traveling across unfamiliar terrain, some of it at night. There was a feeling of imminent drama as even the skies turned gray and threatening. February 14th to 24th, A Squadron was now supporting the opening moves of Operation Desert Storm, a massive bombardment by artillery and the new multi-launch rocket system. <laughs> Nevertheless, nobody was underestimating the enemy they faced. There's no doubt about uh, they have huge numbers. They are dug in, in well-constructed defensive positions. Uh, they have a lot of artillery. They have a lot of tanks. But they have weaknesses as well, mainly in command and control and in the air. And we are a professional army. The Americans are a professional army. And the sheer combat power, both on land, sea, and air, that we have on our at our disposal is awesome. February 24th, Operation Desert Storm, the land offensive, was launched. It opened with two flanking thrusts towards Kuwait and Iraq. The Arab force made a second advance into Kuwait itself. The third element was a combined British and American advance in which QDG were in the vanguard with 16th 5th Lancers. The battle for which they had been training for five months had finally begun. A Squadron had coordinated an air raid by American A-10 aircraft which destroyed a number of enemy gun emplacements and then led through a breach into enemy territory. February 25th, 16th 5th Lancers were directed to advance to Objective Zinc, an Iraqi defensive area close to the border with Kuwait. A 60-kilometer dash late in the day brought the QDG squadron to a point northeast of Zinc. That night, QDG refueled, replenished, and awaited further orders. 0245, February 26th. The squadron was ordered forward to advance on objective lead to identify enemy positions and attack using aircraft and artillery. The battle was raging fiercely across the entire front.
A squadron was now closing on objective lead. Amid the confusion of the battlefield, the squadron's leading vehicles encountered a mysterious wire fence. It was thought to enclose a minefield. However, seeing a gap in the wire, the support troop leader drove his vehicle through it and on down a metalled road, a piece of enterprise which called for considerable courage on a dark night against an unknown enemy. A squadron's only casualty on the night was a vehicle which drove across a mine and damaged its track. A squadron was now calling down heavy bombardment from the air and from land-based missile batteries. The effect was deadly and the damage inflicted was immense. Tanks, APCs, truckloads of infantry, all targets appearing within QDG range of vision were destroyed in a storm of high explosive. A Squadron was in the thick of the fight for over five hours, a hectic, exciting, perplexing episode that passed very quickly but left lasting impressions. The moment that uh, we knew that we were launching into the land offensive, when I gathered the whole squadron around me uh, in the desert uh, prior to going to the staging area and seeing all their faces, um, and tremendous confidence in their ability. And then once we'd started, rather than nerves, I think there was a feeling of, well, let's get on with it, get it finished, and then we can go home. Not so much fear. You never had time to sit down and scare yourself senseless. Uh, what, I, what certainly I felt, and I think a lot of people felt, was trepidation. A professional army that had been in the desert a long time waiting to go, determined to do well, and nothing was going to stop them. And when it actually did start, um, it just seemed like an exercise to me. Dirt, funny enough. It was at the end of it. Everything was so filthy. Total pride, as I said at the beginning, that irrespective of what everybody else says, we know that the Queen's Dragoon Guards and the element of the Queen's Dragoon Guards that went out did the job in only the way that we could do it, which was totally professionally. The ground and air attack went on with unabated ferocity. The list of enemy material destroyed during that action tells something of its intensity. The numbers of prisoners taken during the advance, soldiers who simply wanted to get out from under the bombardment, were too numerous to count. At this time, A Squadron said farewell to 16th 5th Lancers and returned to 7th Armoured Brigade, with whom they had trained for so long. 27th, February the 27th, A Squadron led the brigade from Iraq and into Kuwait with a rapid advance to Objective Varsity, en route to Kuwait City. February the 28th, the momentum of the advance saw A Squadron cover 42 kilometers in just one hour, 20 minutes. They'd been given orders to advance to the Basra Kuwait Highway and secure it before the 8 a.m. ceasefire deadline set by the Allies. QDG arrived on a scene of terrible carnage. Nothing could better illustrate the total destruction of Saddam Hussein's once proud army. Here, in victory, there was compassion for the defeated. An hour later came the ceasefire. The war in the Gulf was over. March 1st, 1991, St. David's Day. A respite for the Welsh cavalry, 
now regrouped and replenishing. There were to be two more days of reconnaissance, logging equipment and charting minefields. But the fight was over and there had not been a single casualty. The main objective now, the only real objective for the men who had spent five months in the desert, was to go home, their job well done. March 15th, 1991, the return to Wolfenbüttel, to wives who'd waited so anxiously, to children they'd not seen, to families, friends and home. Saturday, June 15th, Llandaff Cathedral, Cardiff. A service of thanksgiving for the Welsh cavalry in their home city. And the sermon was given by Bishop Michael Mann, the former Dean of Windsor, and himself once an officer in the regiment. Croiso canes, e ki gid. We gather today to give thanks to God. First and foremost, in all our hearts, is gratitude to God and relief of the safe return of so many of our men from their active service in the Gulf. And no one will feel that more strongly than their wives, children and families who waited over those anxious months and held their loved ones in constant prayer. So we all say, Croiso or no. War in its very beastliness and horror evokes some of man's noblest and finest responses. Sacrifice, bravery and devotion to duty are never offered in vain because they epitomize the highest qualities of human endeavor. For it is easy in times of peace to take the armed forces for granted, to neglect them and to exact from them a so-called peace dividend and then later when we suddenly need them to expect them to put their lives on the line and to risk their all so that the rest of us may continue to enjoy our freedom and our way of life. But if we need to be grateful to the troops, I know that they would want me to say, Dioch Kimru, for all the support given them from home, the blueies, parcels, money, but above all your concern and prayers are something they will never forget. I asked one of our chaps what he thought of the quality of some other Allied troops. He pondered for a moment and then said, the difference was that we knew that we were loved. Those Welsh troopers at the end of the fighting found themselves on the outskirts of Kuwait City on the morning of the 1st of March. What happened? The leaks were distributed to be worn with pride, whilst the red dragon on its white and green background floated above their tanks. Croiso no, diolchiki, diolchithu.